Public log. Z. Vanden, Biological Observer, GST 2252550. Most people don't visit, Z. The vulture glassed our homeworld 400 years ago, and even now the biosphere is barely stable. Too high atmospheric nitrogen, too much carbon dioxide to be healthy for most galactic species, not to mention the fears of lingering radiation hotspots. Even members of my own species, the krill, hardly ever come home for more than Remembrance Day. Since this is a public-facing log and the krill vulture conflict was ultimately a footnote in galactic history, here are the highlights. 400 years ago, the krill and vulture and hegemony were at war. I don't actually remember why, maybe they didn't like krill having translucent wings. A krill cruiser found its way into the Terran home system after a blind FTL jump. No one was actually prepared for first contact, and then the vulture followed them in. The Terrans didn't take too kindly to someone shooting at their guests and returned fire. This diverted the vulture war effort, offering my people a chance to rebuild some. The vulture did not like this and sent a task fleet, and glassed three planets in the KY Prime system, including the homeworld, Z. The Terrans took exception to that, and in the span of three months amassed more atomics than even the Garn Confederacy has ever built and sued for peace with the vulture. The Vulture believed it to be a bluff, and the Terrans cracked three Vulture military planetoids in their home system under sustained atomic bombardment. The Vulture took the hint and capitulated when peace terms were offered a second time by the Terrans. Why do I bring this up close to Remembrance Day? Today I met a Terran for the first time. It was strange. While most members of the galactic community consider them to be a pest and overall rude, this one was not. Even among my people, some might say they have a bit of a hero complex. This one didn't seem to. He got himself Strelok, though I believe that was an assumed identity, as he paused a minute before speaking it. He wanted to know more about Z, from a native stating that there's only so much to be learned from a Galnet travel advisory. Seeing as I am one of the few people planetside actually monitoring the biodiversity, my name was recommended when he travelled through customs and asked for more relevant information about the planetside conditions. I told him about most of the creatures outside the security cordon were wild and quite dangerous. He seemed happy at this news. After a few more questions, he asked me where to rent a speed and whether I knew of any good camping spots. It took some time for an explanation on that. Apparently he's going to sleep outside the outpost in something called a tent. Is this is something human do for fun? I suggested he request a neutron stun rifle from Perimeter Security. He was after all going to be outside the outpost for an extended time and nightfall was too dangerous, even for a native to be outside. He thanked me and said that a stun rifle would be unfair, and as he put it, if I get my head gnawed off, it's my own damn fault. I doubt he will make it through the night. Too many predators. Public Log Z. Vandom, Biological Observer, GSD 2272550. This is probably going to be the most I've written in my personal log in years, at least in one entry. Since my last entry, I gleaned Galnet for information about camping in Terran culture. It is very similar to the old ways many species used to live prior to industrialization, and even prior to agrarian society. Most species don't partake in this ritual of sort and consider it barbaric and uncivilized. Humans, however, camp as a way of reconnecting with nature. Generally speaking, camping by humans is done with an auto shelter and a few creature comforts making the accommodations quaint when compared to their homes. But I also stumbled on a few out-of-the-way net forums dedicated to more hardcore camping, where it seems not only humans, but others as well, take part in this sport. The equipment used for this is no more than a rough spun synthetic fabric shelter that has been manually constructed, an insulation bag for sleeping, and various simple cooking utensils, like stoves that use pressurised hydrocarbon fuels to generate heat. Admittedly, I kept going down this click hole and found even other, more extreme forms of camping that use only a controlled fire for cooking, and even less equipment than that. Strelok falls into this latter category. I went out to try and make sure if he died his next of kin would be informed. When I found him, he was neither dead nor using a tent for shelter. In fact, it was an overgrown pre-war structure that had survived the war and subsequent 400 years of plant growth. He had a small fire burning in some kind of old cabinet and was, as he put it, quite comfortable. I suspect, wherever this Terran is from, his home may in fact be much like the woods outside the outpost. I almost didn't recognise him. Gon was the plain grey flight suit and instead he was clad in a mix of surplus equipment from many combat zones across the galaxy. Plain earthy green BDU similar to those I'd seen in the museum that the Terran troops used while aiding the Krill against the Vulture. 
From the knee down, he wore ceramic titanium armor that looked to be well worn and repurposed Legios Bloodguard gauntlets. The weapon he had with him looked positively ancient, steel and wood construction. He uses individual cartridges with a chemical charge to propel solid metal at high speed. He claimed he had built it, out of a shovel no less, but it looked so old and worn I suspect it's really an antique. I asked how he managed to keep from being eaten, and he said that he marked his territory. That makes sense. Even the apex predators of Z would shy away from unknown factors, much less an off-world omnivore. He asked what he intends while here. His response was that he wants to explore and meet the local wildlife, and possibly practice his survival skills of trapping and hunting. I told him he's insane. I've studied the wildlife around this outpost for 10 standard years. Another predator would certainly kill him if he tried to hunt in his territory. He laughed. He actually laughed and asked if I've actually studied things up close rather than behind a drone controller. No, why would I? That's crazy. Reckless and dangerous. Not since Academy, at least, when I was tricked by one of my seniors to take a direct plant samples. No one's done that since before we'd mastered our plant ecology and begun the march into space. He laughed again and said I wouldn't understand why he was out there as I was, but if I wanted to, he had to tell for me. They spoke of a Terran named Steve, not a story, a legend. According to Strelok, Steve was a Terran that lived during the late 20th century and had an absolute indomitable passion for understanding and quantifying life and protecting it. He would wrestle with creatures called alligators and play with reptiles like snakes, or while helping capture and relocate animals to protect them from other Terrans that wanted to kill them for various reasons. Some wanted the meat, others the skin, still even others just for the sport or because it was a nuisance. It didn't matter where on the Terran home while these creatures resided, he would actively seek them out and try to understand what made them tick. And he primarily resided on one of the most dangerous continents on the planet, not because of war or strife, but merely the animals that lived there were so dangerous and so extreme that even some biologists still have trouble making sense of their evolutionary past to this day. I thanked him for the tale and declined the offer to stay before returning to my speeder, it's not safe out there. He asked me to bring a bottle of alcohol to share for another story if I wanted it. I didn't follow the logic then, and even though I'm watching documentaries about Steve and made by him, it still doesn't make sense. Public Log Z. Vanden, Biological Observer, GST 301 2550. I have spent the last four solar days reading Terran records of Steve Irwin. I cannot be certain if these actually happened or if they are a dramatization. A peachy skin toned Terran male in tan shorts and a shirt with a stick in one hand and an accent that takes the Terran words good day mate and turns it into good day mate and he just picks up creature with a stick nonchalantly and says this is the most dangerous creature on this continent his venom can stop your heart in a matter of seconds and then just plays with it before letting it loose to go wrestle a creature that looks like a gun that was flattened by a ship only to tape his jaw shut in order to safely remove it from a Terran village where it had begun to eat small avian creatures. That is what Steve did. I am terrified and in some way inspired. This might be the lack of sleep or perhaps the Centauri Jin I tried to calm my nerves after seeing the, well, horrifying level of violence that a hippo can muster. But I may take Strella up on his offer of camping before he leaves. I'm, well, giddy, as though I was back at the academy. I haven't been this interested in something since I was a young girl getting to see the homeworld for the first time ever. This may be my last log. Public Log, Z. Vanden, Biological Observer, GSD, 3, 7, 2, 5, 5, 0. Camping is fun, and it's strangely relaxing. Despite running away from predatory creatures and sitting around a fire playing cars and guitar, well, learning to play in my case, I've never actually seen my homeworld up close like this. Over the last six days I've been bit by bugs, chased by wargs, direwolves as Strella calls them, stalked the Olan, which Strella can insist has to be a cousin of the Terran deer, somehow, and delved into ancient ruins to look for lost documents and artifacts. I still don't know if this is what camping is about, but I do... I feel like I've connected to a bit of myself that I've forgotten about. I know my colleagues will find this unorthodox, or even a little heretical, but I feel we've been a bit too clinical with our studies. They're not physically going out into the field and leaving everything to drones and probes is... wrong, for lack of a better word. Strelk and I swapped stories long into the night. Mine were... far less interesting, but he listened closely, and well... Some of his stories, these things called Wendigos, even if there's no proof they ever existed, the mere concept is unnerving. Public Log, Z. Vanden, Biological Observer, GSD, 3, 9, 2, 5, 5, 0. Yesterday tragedy struck, not for myself or Strelok, 
though he seems to be taking it far heavier than I am. When we were hiking through a set of unmapped ruins after collecting a small treasure trove of ancient data shards, we came upon the site of a fight between a warg and a male Atan. The alarm was possibly the largest I'd ever seen, but it was dead, and the warg itself had taken a severe beating. Shred drew his rifle as a precaution, but the warg just had a whining growl and started limping away. While he stood guard in case it was an ambush, I surveyed the scene and recorded what had transpired. Up until now, there's been no record of an Alan actually fighting against a warg, at least not in a Department of Zeeum Biological Survey records. From Strelok's perch in a tree, he called for my attention before shimming down and mentioning there was something I should see. A short hike through the field of ruins later and we found the warg. It turned out to be a female and we watched her brief her last as it lay there desperately trying to crawl into a half-excavated building. Inside we could hear the whining of young warglings. I didn't understand what Strelok said. It was in a Terran dialect, but it sounded sorrowful or like an apology. We've established a camp in some trees just several kilometers from the den, and have a stealth drone camouflaged closer to the den site to observe. Hopefully the mother's wargs, pack mates, will take in the pups. Public Log, Z. Vanden, Biological Observer, GSD, 3, 10, 25, 50. He spent the entire day watching the biomometer. The war pups are starting to starve, and we haven't seen any indication there's other pack members to adopt the wargs. Truthfully, Dibs doesn't have a lot of data on the behaviour of wargs during their denning cycles. This could be normal. Public Log, Z. Vanden, Biological Observer, GSD, 3, 11, 2550. Strelok went and collected the parts from the den. This goes against every code and regulation I know of for biological studies. Officially, I have to admonish him, but it feels like the right thing to do. They haven't even opened their eyes, they're so young and small, and floofy, as Strelok explained. He said he works with a foundation on his homeworld that works with creatures similar to wargs, and after a quick genetic analysis, was able to determine what kind of nutrients would work for them. It's going to take no small amount of paperwork to clear them for off-world travel. I can tell he is excited though. He has a gleam in his eye when he talks about cross-fostering and how the genetics seem to match up, enough based of his scan, that they may be able to hybridise with Terran wolves, and after the excitement of the last week or so, I am interested in seeing the results of this project. Public Log, Z. Vanden, Biological Sciences Oversea, Avian Unorthodox Methodology Unit, GSD, 10 9 25 63. It's been close to a year since I last heard directly from Strelok. According to a technician at the Wolf Cage, the Wolf Breeding and Pack Introduction Foundation he's involved with, he's been long term on a project near the Terminus Systems in an attempt to preserve some of the biological diversity before the Grey and Warther engulfs all the habitable planets. I can't say I'm surprised. In the last 13 years I've known him since he's dropped off the grid, as humans would say, at the drop of a hat, no less than seven times, each time returning just as suddenly to regale me with towers of ice worms and crystalline spiders that shimmer under the light of UV stars. That, how I found out he can see slightly into the UV spectrum and see my wings, which explains the garking when he first met. Honestly, I've actually been rather busy myself since my promotion. The leadership of the department finally relented and gave me funding and a sub-department to actually directly study the flora and fauna of our world, hence my new title. I think the drone's eye view of me resting a warg that had woken up from a stunner blast while I was securing a tracking collar helped my case. I heard it went viral on the G-Net. I don't know. I think the department heads were just terrified I might lead a pack of them directly into their offices. Regardless, lots of paperwork and undergrads to pick through for field teams. There's a pile of undesirables from the Galactic Academy that have already earmarked for interviews. Humans, mostly, but a couple of Kirill that seem a bit more hands-on for their studies than most academics seem to like. Additionally, I received a crate today. The courier that delivered it had the thickest Terran accent I've ever heard, and reeked of engine degreaser. At least, that's what I think it was. Honestly, I've never heard of the company before. Ivanov's Galactic Express. The uniform was olive drab, with a floppy, fuzzy-looking hat with flaps down over his ears. You are the Vadim, da? He had to repeat it several times before I could understand he was speaking Galactic Colon. I affirmed and he handed me a datapad before bringing in a large wooden crate with air holes in the sides. I wasn't expecting a delivery, and the shipping information didn't indicate where in the galaxy it had come from. Delivery from 1. Strelokov to Biological Observer Z. Vadmin. Q bless your day, he explained before leaving, after I handed the datapad back. Taped to the crate was a bundle of paper. Yes, taped paper. Archaic, but I'm used to it and it actually works really well in the field. The text reads as follows. Heard you might be receiving a promotion and have a field operation going soon, so I figured you might want someone to protect you since you'll probably be field going more than before. 
I hope. Don't let them tie you down and make you drive a desk. One of the litters had a runt, and he might be a little easier to handle than one of the larger hybrids. Don't worry, he's from a line that's bred for rich yuppies that want a trainable direwolf as a pet or guard dog. They're fiercely loyal to whoever they pack bond to. Just remember what I taught you about training dogs and you'll be fine. Treat him well. Godspeed. Strelikov. P.S. I think I'll be free before New Year's. Let's catch up and see a hollow or something. There was more to the letter, but that was more of a private nature. Regardless, the crate was simple enough to open. I soon found myself staring face to face with a sleeping and very young warg wolf hybrid with black and silver fur. Fairly old enough to be weaned, much less trained, as well as a reference guide for dog training, just in case I forgot.